Level 0. Let's start at the very beginning. The first nuclear bomb design ever used in war was so simple, it feels like something dreamed up in a physics class. If that class was also classified top secret and run by scientists racing to beat the end of the world, this is the gun type fission bomb. And the idea behind it is almost ridiculously basic. You take two pieces of uranium, both too small on their own to cause a chain reaction, but when you ram one into the other using a small conventional explosion, the two pieces combine into a critical mass. That's when things get dangerous. Fast. What happens next is pure atomic chaos. Neutrons start flying around at unimaginable speed, splitting atoms, releasing energy, and triggering an explosion that can flatten a city in a single instant. The most infamous example of this design is Little Boy. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 19. 45. It was the first time a nuclear weapon was used in war, and the results were horrifying. Over 100,000 people were killed, most of them in seconds. The city was turned into a wasteland. But here's the shocking part. That bomb used about 64 kilograms of uranium, and only a tiny fraction of it actually detonated. Less than 2% of the material contributed to the explosion. The rest either melted, scattered, or just sat there doing nothing. Which means one of the deadliest weapons in history was also wildly inefficient. In fact, scientists quickly realized that this gun-type approach had major flaws. It was bulky, slow to assemble, and had serious safety issues. You could not use plutonium with this method because it tended to start reacting too early, causing what's known as a fizzle instead of a full explosion. That limitation forced researchers to look for a better way, a smarter way. So, while the gun-type bomb made history as the first to be used in war, it was also the last of its kind. The world had seen the terrifying power of fission, but now the challenge was to make it more efficient, more compact, and a lot more reliable. And what came next? That was the real turning point, because because when scientists unlocked the secrets of implosion fission, the entire game changed. Not just in terms of power, but in how nuclear weapons would be built for generations to come. Level 1 after the gun-type bomb proved that nuclear weapons could change the world overnight, scientists went back to the lab with one big question. How do we make this better? And by better, they didn't mean safer. They meant stronger, more efficient, and actually usable with different types of nuclear fuel. The answer was the implosion-type fission bomb. Now this sounds a lot more complicated, and it is, but the concept is actually brilliant. Instead of firing two pieces of uranium together like some atomic cannon, this design used a hollow sphere of plutonium surrounded by high explosives. These explosives were arranged in a precise pattern to detonate all at once, creating an inward pressure that compressed the plutonium core. Think of it like squeezing a rubber ball with dozens of perfectly timed fingers, all pressing in at the same moment. That sudden squeeze increases the density of the core, forces it into a supercritical state, and kicks off a chain reaction with way more efficiency than the gun-type method. And this time, they made it work with plutonium, which was easier to produce in reactors. More material, more bombs, more control over the process. Efficiency was the name of the game. The first real test of this design happened during the Trinity test in July 1945. Out in the New Mexico desert, the United States detonated the world's first implosion-type nuclear bomb. The fireball lit up the sky, turned the sand into glass, and made several scientists question whether they had just invented the beginning of the end. But the most unforgettable example came only weeks later. Fat Man, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, used this exact implosion method. The yield was even greater than Hiroshima's, and this time, despite rough terrain and a slightly off target target detonation, the bomb still caused massive destruction and loss of life. The shift from gun type to implosion was more than just a technical upgrade. It marked the moment nuclear weapons became reliable tools of war, smaller, more efficient, and capable of using more types of fissile material. Plus, this design could serve as the primary stage in even more powerful weapons, which we'll get to in just a moment. But even this wasn't enough, because while implosion bombs worked better, they still had limits. Scientists wanted more explosive yield, more control, and something even deadlier so they pushed the boundaries again. What if you could take this implosion design and supercharge it with fusion fuel? What if you could create a bomb that didn't just split atoms, but fuse them together for even more destructive power? That question led to the next breakthrough, a bomb that didn't just improve on the last one, but redefined everything nuclear weapons could become. And that is where boosted fission enters the picture. Level 2. So, by now, scientists had figured out how to make nuclear bombs more efficient. The implosion design worked. It was compact, powerful, and far more reliable than the old gun-type method. But of course, in true Cold War fashion, good enough was never actually good enough. That brings us to a clever little upgrade called boosted fission. And no, it doesn't mean the bomb just gets a caffeine shot before exploding. This is where things start to blur the line between regular nuclear bombs and something much more advanced. The boosted fission bomb still uses the same basic implosion concept. You compress a core 
core of plutonium or uranium until it goes super critical and triggers a chain reaction. But here's the twist. Right before the core detonates, a small amount of fusion fuel is added into the center. Usually it's a gas made of deuterium and tritium, which are both forms of hydrogen. Now you might think, wait a second, is this a hydrogen bomb? Not quite. That's the next level. But boosted fission is the stepping stone. When the fission reaction starts, the intense heat and pressure from the implosion are enough to kick off a miniature fusion reaction inside the core. That fusion produces a sudden burst of high energy neutrons, which feed right back into the fission reaction. More neutrons means more atom splitting, and that means a bigger explosion from the same amount of material. The result is kind of sneaky. From the outside, a boosted fission bomb might not look very different. It can be small enough to fit inside a missile or dropped from a plane. But when it detonates, it releases far more energy than a traditional fission bomb of the same size. Think of it like upgrading your engine without changing the car. Quietly, behind the scenes, you've just given it a massive power boost. And because boosted bombs are more efficient, you can also dial them up or down. That flexibility makes them incredibly useful in modern arsenals. They're used as primaries in thermonuclear weapons, but also on their own as tactical weapons. Small package, big impact. Boosted fission is the moment where nuclear weapons started getting smarter. Not just bigger explosions, but more control, more reliability, and more options for delivery. But even this wasn't the final form, because scientists weren't satisfied with using fusion as just an add-on. They wanted to take fusion and make it the star of the show. A full-scale reaction, no more supporting role. They wanted a bomb that could unleash the same power that fuels the sun. And when they finally did it, the result was unlike anything the world had ever seen. Welcome to level 3 the age of the thermonuclear bomb. Level 3. Up until now, everything we've looked at has involved splitting atoms. Gun-type bombs, implosion bombs, even boosted fission bombs all rely on tearing heavy atoms apart to release energy. But at some point, scientists looked at that and said, what if we stopped breaking atoms and started fusing them instead? Enter the thermonuclear bomb, also known as a hydrogen bomb. And this is not just a bigger version of what came before. It is a different class of weapon entirely. This is where the story jumps from city-level destruction to something far worse. The concept behind a thermonuclear bomb is known as the Teller-Ulam design, named after physicists Edward Teller and Stanislaw Ulam. It's a two-stage weapon, and each part has a very specific job. The first stage is a boosted fission bomb, just like we saw in level two. But its only job here is to create the conditions needed to ignite the second stage. And that second stage? That's where fusion happens. Using materials like lithium deuteride, the bomb harnesses the insane heat and pressure from the primary explosion to compress and ignite fusion fuel in the secondary core. We're talking about temperatures in the millions of degrees, the kind of heat you find in the center of stars, literally. When those hydrogen isotopes fuse together, they release a staggering amount of energy far more than any fission bomb could ever manage. And because fusion produces a flood of high-energy neutrons, it can even set off additional reactions in surrounding materials, boosting the yield even further. The result? Thermonuclear weapons are not measured in kilotons. They are measured in megatons. That is millions of tons of TNT. Some of the largest hydrogen bombs ever tested could vaporize entire islands and leave craters visible from space. The Soviet Union's Tsar Bomba, tested in 1961, remains the most powerful nuclear device ever detonated. It was so massive it had to be scaled down to avoid destroying the aircraft that dropped it. Even then, the blast shattered windows over 500 miles away. Had it been used in war, the devastation would have been beyond comprehension. But this kind of power comes at a price. Thermonuclear bombs are not just weapons. They are instruments of global destruction. They form the backbone of most strategic arsenals today. Submarine-launched missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, heavy bombers, all of them can carry thermonuclear warheads. This is where the conversation stops being theoretical. These bombs are real. They exist. And they are ready at a moment's notice. But not all nuclear weapons are designed to level cities. Some are made for something even darker. Not to destroy buildings, but to target life itself. Because in the next level, we look at a weapon that kills you. Without even knocking down your house. Level 4. By now, we've seen nuclear weapons that can destroy entire cities. Bombs that light up the sky with the power of stars and leave nothing but ash behind. But what if a nuclear weapon was designed not to flatten buildings, but to kill people while leaving the city standing? That's the chilling idea behind the neutron bomb. Officially known as an enhanced radiation weapon, this device flips the traditional concept of destruction on its head. While most nuclear bombs cause mass devastation through heat and blast, the neutron bomb is designed to release a much higher dose of radiation while keeping its 
explosive force relatively low. At first glance, that might sound like a good thing. Less blast means less destruction, right? But the horrifying part is in the details. The neutron bomb works by boosting the release of fast neutrons at the moment of detonation. These neutrons are highly penetrating and lethal to living tissue. Unlike heat or shock waves, they can pass through buildings, vehicles, and even tank armor. This makes the weapon uniquely deadly to soldiers and civilians while sparing infrastructure. In the Cold War era, that idea had a specific purpose. Neutron bombs were designed as tactical weapons, meant to stop massive waves of Soviet tanks rolling across Europe. A conventional nuke would flatten everything, including friendly cities. But a neutron bomb could neutralize invading forces without destroying the city they were attacking. From a military standpoint, it made a strange kind of sense. But from a human standpoint, it was terrifying. Imagine a battlefield where everything looks intact from the air, but the people on the ground are gone. No collapsed buildings, no burning ruins, just silence. The idea sparked huge controversy when the United States began developing neutron bombs in the 1970s. Critics called it a capitalist bomb, designed to protect property while ignoring human life. Protests erupted across Europe. Even within military circles, the ethics were hotly debated. The United States did produce a small number of these weapons, and some were deployed for a time. But the political fallout made them too controversial to keep in the spotlight. Most of them were quietly retired. Still, the technology exists. The concept works, and some believe similar designs are still part of modern arsenals today. Neutron bombs show us something deeper about nuclear weapons. It is not just about how big the blast is, but how the damage is delivered, what you target, what you spare, and what message you send. But this is not the end of the nuclear evolution, because while neutron bombs were meant to be tactical, small, and targeted, the next concept is even stranger, a weapon that might not even need fission to work. A theoretical design so advanced it has never been proven, but if it ever does become real, everything we know about nuclear weapons could change forever. Level 5. Every nuclear weapon we have talked about so far has relied on the same formula. First, split the atom. Then, use the energy from that explosion to trigger something even bigger. Fission to start, fusion to finish. But what if you could remove the first step entirely? No uranium? No plutonium? No radioactive trigger at all. That brings us to one of the most haunting concepts in modern physics. A weapon powered entirely by fusion. It is called a pure fusion bomb, and while it has never been proven to exist, the theory behind it is very real. Unlike every nuclear device ever built, a pure fusion bomb would not need any fissile material. It would not start with a chain reaction. Instead, it would ignite fusion directly, using extreme heat, pressure, or other exotic methods. If someone found a way to pull it off, the result would be a nuclear weapon that leaves behind no classic signature, no mushroom cloud with radioactive fallout, no telltale trace of uranium or plutonium, just a blinding flash of energy and the sudden end of everything in its path. This idea is terrifying for more than one reason. First, it would be nearly impossible to detect before use. Without the need for fissile material, these weapons could be built in secret and hidden more easily than any bomb we know today. They would be much harder to monitor through traditional arms control methods. Second, pure fusion bombs could be scalable, small enough to fit inside a backpack, large enough to flatten entire cities. They could be clean, releasing minimal long-term radiation, or they could be dirty, engineered to maximize devastation. The design possibilities are wide open, and that is exactly what makes them so dangerous. Some experts believe high-powered lasers or magnetic compression might one day make pure fusion possible. Others think it will remain science fiction, but research has already happened behind closed doors, and every now and then, a classified document or suspicious detail suggests that we may be closer than anyone wants to admit. If this kind of weapon ever became real, it could change the entire balance of global power. Countries with no nuclear arsenal today might suddenly find themselves on level ground. Nations with existing weapons could develop new ones that bypass current treaties, and the line between conventional and nuclear war would become even harder to see. Pure fusion is not just a theory. It is a glimpse into a future where the most powerful weapons are no longer limited by the past. No radioactive material, no traditional warning signs, just silence, and then light. Because when the ability to destroy cities becomes easier to hide, the question is no longer who has the most weapons. It becomes who can make them disappear until the moment they are used. And in that world, the greatest danger is not what we already know. It is what we are still willing to imagine. 